When the Super NES launched in 1990, it represented a generational leap in 2D tile-based drawing. The hardware came stock with advanced graphical features that for 1990 was considered groundbreaking for a home console. And the result would be some visually beautiful looking games that look as striking today as they first did 30 years ago. It's why the hardware is still popular with retro enthusiasts and why Nintendo continues to offer a selection of Super NES games to play on their NSO service. Now, of course, the Super NES was assisted with expansion chips to push various enhancements to games as well. But for this episode, we're mostly going to focus on games without any expansion hardware. The Super NES supports up to four background layers and an object or sprite layer. Background layers can be all scrolled individually and depending on the various mode that the developer uses for their games, they have access to one or more of these backgrounds. Each mode has its limitations with respect to the number of colors and the number of background layers it supports. But what is less known about the hardware is how the Super NES handles many of its effects. When we talk about 8 and 16-bit consoles that use tile-based drawing, the final result is a combination of all these layers put together. This is pretty common in 2D tile drawing of the era. However, the Super NES actually has two separate screens that these backgrounds and objects can render into. The first is known as Main, which is as it sounds. The second is known as Sub, which is a secondary screen that will always hold an exact copy of the same image data that's in Main. You could think of Sub as sort of a render target when we think about modern 3D. So you might be wondering, what is the purpose of the sub screen? Well, it's quite simple. Both main and sub can be enabled or disabled by individual background layers. In other words, the programmer can define which screen a background layer can be rendered into by enabling or disabling each of the background layer bits in these registers. The sub screen can be disabled as well if there's no requirement for it. However, the reason why Nintendo decided with the sub screen is to perform color math calculations between the main screen and the subscreen. Color math is sort of a precursor to what I would consider modern blending in shaders, but keep in mind that it's not exactly the same thing as the Super NES has no concept of alpha channels. Instead, it uses a 15-bit BGR color format or five bits per pixel with no alpha. So with these two screens and by performing color math between them, it means that effects such as transparency, lighting, shadowing, and masking are all possible, just to name a few. The results are games that look much more animated and interesting. Take, for example, Donkey Kong Country, one of my favorite games. This lighting effect looks quite sharp, doesn't it? We're talking about a 2D volumetric lighting effect. I remember the first time I saw this effect back in the day, my jaw dropped. What's happening behind the scenes is that the main screen has enabled background layers 1 and 2 and the object layer, while the subscreen has layer 3 enabled to display the simulated blue volumetric light. Then color addition is applied so that the subscreen data is added to the main screen data to show the final result. Color addition is mainly used to simulate rays of light. Another popular example is Chrono Trigger, when at the start of the game when the curtain opens in Chrono's room, the effect of god rays coming through the windows adds some lighting to the scene. Or this scene from the church, you can see the light rays coming in through the stained glass window and reflecting off the altar. Notice how when Chrono walks through the light, the sprite's color palette is also updated to reflect this lighting change. Color subtraction is the second color math option and a fairly popular one. In this scenario, the subscreen data is subtracted from the main screen, and if the result is less than zero, then the value is clamped to zero. A great example of color subtraction is this level in Adam's family's Pugsley's scavenger hunt. The main screen contains background layers one and two, and the subscreen contains background layer three, which is the tiles to draw this large circular area that when subtracted from the main screen will darken the areas outside of it giving off the illusion of a light source. Another popular example is Torchlight Trouble from the Donkey Kong Country game. The torch areas outside of the rays are much darker. If we look closer, the main screen contains the mask for the torch on background three, 
while the sublayer contains backgrounds 1, 2, and 3, including the sprites. But notice that everything appears to have its colors reversed. This is because the Super NES also allows the programmer to subtract from a fixed color, in this instance yellow, and it was most likely programmed this way to darken the entire screen, including all the sprites. Color averaging, or addition then halving, is one of the more popular blending options in many Super NES games. It takes the average of the two images, making one of the screens look translucent. This allows things like water effects, fog, clouds, shadows, and this very popular early scene in Secret of Mana shows the color averaging between screens. But this effect is used in many games, and in many ways, it's part of what makes many Super NES games so distinctive. Now I do want to pause here for a moment and talk about the early days of Super NES emulation. Going back to the early days of ZSNES, SNES 9.6 and NLK SNES, emulating transparencies was challenging for different reasons. The first is that the documentation around it wasn't very well understood. While I explained it here very rudimentally, programming an emulator at the instruction level and to accurately simulate timings between the SNES PPU and CPU was complex enough. Then emulating the PPU and its registers and when to apply color math would involve many assumptions and guesswork. After all, the Super NES, like most consoles, was a closed platform and documentation was not available. Second, at the time, DOS was the standard operating system for these emulators, and in most scenarios, they would use a 256 color VGA display that ran at 320 by 240. The problem is that the Super NES, we said, has a 15-bit color palette, and trying to squeeze these color values down to a 256 8-bit index display would not look accurate. Third, and most importantly, we said that the main and sub-screens at all times contain the exact same image data. Now, outside of hacks, where if the game did not use the sub-data, the emulator needs to copy screen data twice per frame. This is before any color math is applied. As a result, transparencies in early SNES emulation was a real sticking point, and this is much of the reason why emulators were so slow. It wasn't really until SNES 9X and later versions of ZSNES that this functionality was emulated accurately. The Super NES also came with masking windows. This is where a window can be placed either in the main or subscreen or both to mask off a portion of any background on the scan line. And then by applying HDMA, they can be adjusted per scan line. This can be combined in various ways to produce some really cool effects. One of the more popular uses of masking windows is in Super Metroid at the early section of the game once Samus retrieves the Morph Ball but there are many use cases for masking windows that you probably don't even realize. The speech dialogue frames used in Chrono Trigger use masking windows to supply the color gradient inside of it. And one of my favorite uses of masking windows is the crystal ball effect in Pugsley's Scavenger Hunt. Let's take a closer look here. You can see that the main screen contains the entire viewport. In this particular level, the subscreen isn't used at all. All image data is sent to main. The masking effect is applied to background 3. Color math is then blended to form the final result. Also notice when the witch blinks in the subscreen, it's not just the individual tiles that are being replaced, rather the entire image is swapped quickly when she closes her eyes, then switches back to the first image. With clever HD matrix, it really shows off a cool looking effect. Also notice the transparency on the top left of the crystal ball to simulate the effect of glass. The Super NES also supports Mosaic, built into the PPU hardware. This creates a screen pixelation effect and is often used to fade in or fade out screens. Mosaic on the Super NES is often incorrectly thought to be Mode 7, but it's simply not. It's a complete separate register that can be applied on a per background basis. The introduction to Street Fighter 2, where the logo spins and zoom, is using the mosaic effect, and it has nothing to do with Mode 7 at all. Another game that has clever use of mosaic is the Magical Quest starring Mickey Mouse. At the final boss, the mosaic effect is used when the boss takes damage, but it's also applied to the walls. And notice when this happens, the mosaic effect isn't applied to the boss itself. 
With individual background lay scrolling and HDMA, it's quite common to see effects such as parallax scrolling or horizontal scrolling at different offsets. But the Super NES also has a feature what's known as offsets per tile. These offsets per tile can be applied both horizontally and vertically. And because it's at the tile level, it's not as granular as applying horizontal line scrolling via HDMA, but when applied vertically, it can provide some interesting effects, including the simulation of rotation. Now I did say at the start that we wouldn't be talking about custom chips, but here's Star Fox. On level one, you can see the background slightly rotate to the left or to the right as the ship banks. Now to be clear, this is not using the super effects, which is what I thought it was doing all these years. Instead, it's using standard offset per tile vertically, which doesn't require the super effects for its math. Another area I've seen offsets per tile being done vertically is in Super Turrican 2. When jumping from these large enemy snake looking things, they angle slightly down. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Mode 7 because there is one more trick up the sleeve of the Super NES that we need to cover. As a quick primer, Mode 7 only enables a single background that can have affine transformations applied to it. The classic example of Mode 7 is either Super Mario Kart or the rotating tunnel in Super Castlevania. You can see the background tile set here is static, but the Mode 7 transformations applied with HDMA provide the rotating tunnel effect and it looks awesome. But what you may not know is that Mode 7 can also enable a secondary background known as EXTBG, which uses the first background's tile sets and color data, but with only 128 colors instead of 256. The upper bit of the color is used as a priority bit. This is because without setting a priority bit, it would be impossible to layer sprites behind a Mode 7 background. But the question is, why would you ever want to layer sprites behind a Mode 7 background? Well, there are a handful of games that do exactly this. If we take a look at the Mode 7 stage on Contra 3, when the main sprite walks into the tunnel, the sprite is hidden behind the Mode 7 layer. This is because the priority bits are set on the tiles around the tunnel to bring the EXTBG tiles in front of the main Mode 7 background tiles. Another example is this boss fight in Super Turrican 2. This is a great example of the use of EXTBG. You can see that the main Turrican sprite is sitting inside the mouth behind the teeth. Once again, it's giving off the illusion of depth in this scene. As you can see, as the Turrican sprite moves outside of the teeth, the sprite moves back into the foreground. And this is all happening at the same time as the Mode 7 rotation. And it's for these reasons and more is to why, in my opinion, Super NES games still hold up so well to this day. It's also a good reason why many GBA ports that came originally from the SNES are considered inferior to the originals. Being able to blend two separate screens together in unique ways was quite unheard of at the time, not to mention Mode 7 was a massive selling point of what the hardware could do. And with window effects and HDMA, it was the complete package of what a 2D home console should be. All for just $199 at launch, the Super NES was a fantastic piece of kit. But I do hope you enjoyed this episode, and let me know of your favorite examples of Super NES games that still amaze you in 2025. But for now, we're going to leave it here for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, don't forget to leave me a thumbs up, and I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Bye for now.